In the country of Elvengard, you find two elves, who are far from friends. Lord Barthol stares at her attributes, while asking Feel to relinquish her position within the Nervalin family. Obviously, she politely declines, followed by him suggesting she stay the night, so they can talk it over. You see, Barthol has evidence that she's planning to free the slaves. Feel asks to cut to the chase, so a deck of magic cards is summoned. Oracle Cards is essentially an elven duel, where you use pairs of cards to attack your opponent, all the while defending yourself with magic. If Barthol wins, he demands her 100% full submission, and if Feel wins, she demands he unconditionally assist them. Each chooses their first pair, followed by the card springing to life. Barthol's knight charges forward, but Feel's maiden convinces it to switch sides, turning it back on its master. He exclaims what a cowardly opening, and that a duo caster like her stands no chance against a tricaster such as him. Elsewhere, Barthol's butler is overlooking the match, secretly using magic to aid his lord. Fritz is interrupted by a filthy, flat-chested amenity, ordering him to challenge her to a game. Kermi knows all about his illegal drug trade, however they surely have no idea that Lord Barthol is the true kingpin. With little choice, he challenges this pathetic amenity, which turns into a simple game of chance. King beats queen, ace beats king, and queen beats ace. Upon Fritz's victory, all evidence of his crimes will be erased, but if Kurumi wins, he'll have to confess. The cards are dealt as Fritz thinks about how Feel failed out of magic school, so there's no way she could overpower Barthol in the short time span of this game. Now holding the ace, he uses magic to determine her card to be the king. Knowing he's going to win, he exclaims her brain to be just as puny as her chest. The cards are then revealed, with Fritz being the loser, as Kurumi's card was actually the queen. She recommends he should double check his opponent next time, as the disguise fades away revealing feel. Using magic, she also verifies his abnormally small member. Back in the courtyard, Kermie is thanking Lord Barthol for his cooperation. He's unsure how they managed to disguise themselves, but the charade is over so he turns to leave. Though in response, the real Kermie sets her pair, proclaiming this duel isn't over. He angrily asks what they think they're doing, but Kermie instead asks if he'd like to resign. Once again, Lord Barthol takes another attack, followed by field chuckling that looked painful. The women reveal they're well aware that Barthol is the true crime lord, but he just laughs because they're obviously cheating since an amenity can't defend against magic. It's pointed out, however, that when setting up this game, Kermi only ever referred to herself as we. Besides, they know Fritz was assisting him too. Lord Barthol then realizes, Kermi and Feel were both disguised. Another two spells were used to make that undetectable, plus a spell to win the game against Fritz and another to defend Kermi. The women exclaim he's finally figured it out, and that it's probably hard to think when your blood's rushing to the wrong place. It's revealed that Feel is actually a hex caster, and upon taking numerous more attacks, Lord Barthol resigns, as any more could kill him. With that victory, they order Barthol to wait a few weeks and turn himself in, and also to forget any of this ever happened. Fritz is to do the same thing, leaving Kermie to wonder what will happen to Lord Barthol's business. Feel gladly explains that it will go to another lord, one which our two women already paid a visit to a few days ago. A bit later, you find out that Feel did in fact fail out of magic school, however that was just an act, as she's a genius able to maintain six different spells at once. She abandoned her life of fame in favor of protecting Kurami, even though Elvengard may be destroyed in the process. Now this level of magic is still exhausting, prompting Kurami to apologize for needing Feel's help, and that she's sure Blank could have won by themselves. Of course, Feel can't see the memories Kermie gained from Sora, but she points out that Sora uses everyone around him for his own benefit. Kermie admits to feeling like nothing more than a burden, but is told she's the only reason Feel can keep moving forward. Now at an inn on the outskirts of town, Kermie thinks about Sora and Shiro holding each other, before asking Feel to share a bed with her. It's while stroking Kermie's hair that Feel brings up the possibility that Sora may have gave her fake memories. Kermie, however, doubts that and thinks about how Sora's motivation to push forward is to be just as good as his little sister. Then while drifting off to sleep, she mutters, Sora doesn't lie. Inside her grandfather's hidden library, Steph is pitching a fit, as they're supposed to look for a book that may not even exist. Izuna can't even read a manity, and is holding her book upside down, prompting Steph to hand her a book that teaches the language. 20,000 meters up in the sky, they find a city of cubes floating on the back of an Exceed Rank 2, Phantasma. 
This is Avantheim, the homeland of the Flugel. But this wintry scene is interrupted by Plum's pained screaming due to the sunlight. Jibriel honestly forgot the Dampier was here, though before teleporting them inside, she makes two requests of her masters. First, no matter what happens, they shouldn't despair. And second, they're not to lose faith in her. With their explosive entrance, books are launched all across the room, followed by a girl frantically picking them up. This is apparently the leader of the Flugel, who likes referring to herself as Jibs's older sister. They've come seeking permission for Sora and Shiro to use this library, and in return, Jibra will think about calling Asriel big sister. Deal accepted. Asriel rushes to hug Jibs, but slams into the wall. The Flugel leader declares that Jibs lied to her, but it's pointed out Jibriel only promised to think about it. Sora then introduces himself, and you find out that each Flugel was independently created by Lord Artosh, and that Jibriel is the youngest and strongest. Asriel wonders if Sora could maybe command Jibriel to call her big sister, or even force them to bathe together. In response, he pulls out some video footage of Jibriel in the bath, followed by Asriel wanting to bet the Flugel race piece for it. That, however, would require the council's approval, so Asriel will resort to serving Sora and Shiro as well. But Blank rejects this, declaring Jibriel to be enough. Our amenities turn their attention to the books, and Asriel can't believe the strongest Flugel would bow her head to such low creatures, prompting Jibril to state this hard-headedness is why the Flugel failed. Roughly 30 minutes later, after making no progress, Sora asks about the Siren Queen. Asriel doesn't know where the books are at, because once she memorizes the contents, they're of no use to her anymore. Sora offers up Jibril's bath footage and the Big Sister title as a trade, but Asriel refuses to help them. If they need assistance that badly, they should just challenge all the Flugel, as they're teleported into a crowd of more than 100. You come to find out that Jibril has been evangelizing about her great masters, and she suggests they challenge all these Flugel to a game. If they win, it'll be easy to locate any book they want. However, if they lose, they'll be subjected to a massive meet and greet with their fans. The game itself will be tag, which seems entirely unfair for our two pathetic amenities. To give them a chance, some of the Flugel will have syllables on their body that if touched can be taken and used once each to create objects and phenomenon. FYI, as these books are originally written in Japanese, the words created don't always match up well in English. So to reduce confusion, I may change a word or two to make it more appropriate to the actual outcome. As a demonstration, Jibril throws a word at Asriel, manifesting an octopus resulting in that type of scene. There's also the issue that a manatee can't fly, so Asriel allows the hidden Dampier to take part alongside them, and suggests she drinks their fluids to sustain herself. Our group, however, is still at a massive disadvantage, but ultimately they decide to trust in Jibril. With Plum transformed as their wings, they demand to be given a 5 minute head start, and for this landscape to be transformed into something more friendly to them. With a single spell, the sun is replaced by the moon, and they're handed a map of the new layout. Jibriel bows to thank them. Sora says, don't let us down, followed by Shiro stating, you have to protect your family. Upon waking up, Steph is surprised to find that Izuna has already learned to read a manatee. Apparently, she's been choosing to read books based on whether or not they smelled like Sora and Shiro. Then with a stumble, Steph accidentally bumps into a shelf, as Izuna instinctively bites a book out of the air, due to it smelling like fish. With an epiphany, Steph asks Izuna to sniff out any books of similar age that contain both a fishy and old man smell. In the meantime, Steph will make some food. Izuna's blood break dissipates as a new stack of books lay beside her. It's been 6,000 years since Lord Artosh, the creator of the Flugel, died, leaving them to wonder why they exist. You find out Asriel can order the self-extinction of their race at any moment, which she plans to do if they can't find a purpose. Now it's obvious Jibro has changed since meeting these amenities, which she claims to be due to the excitement of having her previous understandings turned upside down. But Asriel just can't seem to grasp this vague concept. Their head start is over, Sora states their lives are in her hands, and Plum promises they'll all go down together. They dive quickly, gaining speed, but the Flugel have already caught up. With a short, almost coded exchange, they spiral upwards, narrowly avoiding their pursuers. This close call also earned them two syllables, and you find out Shiro has memorized the location of all 46 syllables before the game even began. Erupting from a narrow crevice, our group finds themselves completely surrounded. Slamming together the word hollow causes the flugel to phase through them, earning our group another eight syllables. Through all of this, Plum accidentally loses her grip and is forced to reattach to Sora's neck. This unexpected sensation throws them off balance, giving the flugel an opening. With a millisecond to spare, they create the word barrier, allowing them to collect even more syllables and duck into another crevice. With that, Shiro proclaims they have what they need, followed by them flying straight up into the open sky. 
This uncharacteristically bad move puts their opponents on guard, so they simply watch as our group enacts the word. Accelerate. Jibril is in awe they completed that word so soon, all the while Azriel looks bored. Randomly, Jibril explains that on occasion she likes to reread books. Azriel spits she should just memorize them, but is told you can learn new stuff the second time through. The Flugel leader wonders how this relates to the current game, but only receives a look of disappointment. Blank now has speed surpassing the Flugel and even the sound barrier, but can barely dodge a homing beam of magic. Jibril clarifies the beam to be a harmless capture spell, and that only six can be shot at a time. If it's only that many, our group has no reason to worry. Oh, she meant each flugel can fire six at once. Rocketing through the sky at top speed, they use every maneuver they know to just barely avoid the barrage. Finding a moment's rest, Shiro pants for air, as she kicks herself for not thinking about the possibility of magic beforehand. Plum shrieks she can't take this anymore, as Sora realizes they don't need to dodge. Streaking upwards as the cluster of spells close in, Sora enacts the word rotate. The entire world spins around on the point he specified, causing the homing spells to connect with the flugel that launched them. The spells activate, pulling the 38 captured flugel toward them, followed by Sora using the words vapor and bear. Of course, removing their clothes was strictly strategy, as it made it easier to collect the syllables while also slowing down their now embarrassed opponents. The Flugel, however, are not hindered in the slightest, as Shiro reminds him that Jibril wouldn't be bothered by this at all. Sora exclaimed the word massage, forcing the bare Flugel to begin massaging one another. Azrael's expression still hasn't changed, prompting Jibril to ask if they all must die due to their leader's inability to understand. At this point, the 100 Flugel are struggling to think up new strategies, as everything they've tried so far has failed, yet they're smiling from ear to ear. Trying another approach, Jibril brings up her numerous accomplishments during the Great War. She managed to defeat a Gigant, a Dragonia, and even a Phantasma all by herself. Each of these feats were believed to be impossible, and nearly resulted in Jibril's death. However, that impossibility is exactly what drove her to do it. Still unable to comprehend, Astro proclaims she doesn't want the last 6,000 years to go to waste, and pleads for anyone to explain why the Flugel still exist. Taking a brief moment to recompose herself, Jibro prepares to steal a strategy from Sora and Shiro's playbook, before howling that Asriel is a stupid heap of trash that she despises from the bottom of her heart. This was the first bluff Jibro ever made, causing Asriel to be so done with all of this. While walking through Elkia, our werebeast receives numerous glares from passing a manatee. Izuna wonders why Steph doesn't hate her as well, but it turns out Steph doesn't have a deep reason, and is called a dumbass for it. There's a shout, before a duo is surrounded by numerous children. Werebeasts are mixed in with a manatee, as the kids beg for the famous Isuna to play with them. Sadly, she doesn't have time today, and after walking a distance, she takes back calling Steph a dumbass. Azrael exclaims they can't understand unless Jibro explains it clearly. Our group bursts inside, interrupting with the word artillery, successfully firing a howitzer shell at point-blank range. Plum can't believe they just did that, causing Sora to state they just wanted to skip the cutscene. Not to mention, Blank had already figured out that Asriel is also the representative for the Phantasma known as Avant Time. Plus, the commandments don't allow violence, so the fact the cannon hit proves this world is just an illusion. Now back in the sky, dodging the rain of Hellfire, they form the word Disconnect, slicing this illusion world in two, thus allowing the Flugel to pour inside. Just as they're about to retreat, the Flugel bow their heads, offering up the final six syllables as a trade for this wonderful experience. And it's at this moment that Blank realizes Jibril was planning this from the beginning. Asriel is shocked the other Flugel can understand, so she moves in to claim victory for herself. Our group rockets toward her at an impossible speed. Plum screams this is insane, but is silenced as Sora uses a word to produce blood for her to drink. Back in time, just after the death of Lord Artosh, you find Asriel helplessly watching as her comrades begin, unaliving themselves. To stop this, she chooses to lie, claiming that Lord Artosh preemptively ordered all of them to seek out the reason for his defeat. Only after finding this answer will Asriel decide whether or not they should go on living. Our group arrives in a dark room, using their few spare syllables to illuminate it. Azrael exclaims they've wasted 6,000 years searching for nothing, and Shiro states Flugel's extinction would be a problem because Jibril is their friend. He wonders if Azrael's ever created something for herself, as Jibril clutches her book tight. He's well aware our two Flugel bet their lives on the outcome of this game, and he's curious if she knows why. Azrael assumes it's because Jibs believes Blank will win, but she's reprimanded for such a stupid answer. They each bolt towards the other, but Azrael successfully tags Blank, 
Plum instantly apologizes for the deception, followed by Blank using the remaining 13 syllables to literally punch the word restriction into Asriel. At last, the time limit is reached, making Sora and Shiro the victors. Collapsing to the floor, Azrael thinks back to the day the final Flugel was created. She remembers how Lord Artosh purposely made this one flawed, declaring her flaw to be the key to perfection. The first thing Azrael notices is that her body feels unusually heavy, due to the word cutting off her use of magic. It's after tasting defeat that the stubborn Flugel finally realizes the excitement born from the unknown. These past 6,000 years, she's been searching for a concrete answer, but that never existed at all. Maybe with enough effort, Azrael can change herself to be more like Jibs, but that's instantly rejected, as Azrael should only be herself. Jibreel then humbly apologizes for wagering her life, followed by Sora revealing that Azrael doesn't actually hold that authority. Not to mention the fact that Jibreel belongs to Sora and Shiro anyways. With her very first laugh, Azrael swoops in, planting a long kiss on Sora. Shiro isn't happy that just happened, but I mean it's not like he did anything to cause it. So Jibra points out the commandments would have prevented the kiss if he didn't consent. Turning back, Azrael states she's always wondered how humanity managed to survive the Great War, and that she's unable to instate Blank as their official lord, but she'll at least talk to the council about joining Elkia's commonwealth. In the meantime, Jibra promises to keep preaching the good news of her masters, and then says goodbye to her big sister. With that, Azrael departs, choosing to keep the Samanity body for a while longer. Back in the Hidden Library, Steph asks why Izna isn't worried about Gramps. That's because Sora promised to rescue him, but Steph can't bring herself to trust that liar. Of course, Blank tricks people, but according to their smell, they never actually lie. Unlike Steph, who sometimes reeks of deceit, especially when talking about Sora. A certain book then catches Steph's eye, which turns out to be the fairy tale the Queen read before falling asleep. Her grandfather's notes conclude that the Queen desires what she cannot have, as Steph realizes their search is over. After an unknown number of books, our group loses hope as they're not finding anything new. There's a monstrous wail in the distance, which Jibro explains to be the voice of Avant Time. It still cries due to the loss of Lord Artosh, and instinctively seeks out beings as strong as an old deuce. However, it'll never reach those as they live on the moon. Now pissed off, Sora complains that even Avant Heim knows love, prompting Jiro to ask if there's anyone he couldn't live without. Of course, Shiro is the answer, but that's not romantic love. Curiously, Jibro wants to be called useless. Sora complies, followed by a scream of pained ecstasy. She proclaims herself to understand romantic love, and now gets how Steph must feel all the time. Snapping awake, Shiro figured out how to win the Queen's game, stating that her brother misread the Queen, leaving Sora to despair at his own uselessness. Having her sleep interrupted yet again, she hears a man ask if she seeks love. Miss Queen introduces herself and states she does, fully expecting this mere amenity to grovel at her feet. But instead, Oceane warps into a hellscape, with the ground trembling and baby monsters raining from the sky. Looking up, she spots a flugel eagerly awaiting her cue, as Sora declares, I'll wait for you in the tower. Come try and make me fall in love with you. The sirens cheer at the Queen's agony, but Eno is just confused. Steph doesn't fully understand this either, and Plum is just glad he blocked the Queen's sense of pain. The city is destroyed, as the Queen is mutilated time and time again. Jibril's very first blast vaporized the ocean, forcing our siren to slowly crawl across the sea floor. During this, she loses all sense of time, due to being repeatedly torn apart, but she eventually reaches the water-filled tower. Now, as the Siren Queen, nobody can resist her charm, so she's so ready to make this humanity regret this day. She's met with an insult, and responds by ordering him to crawl at her feet. Sora says that wasn't sexy at all, and asks if she's even trying to win him over. Changing tactics, she apologizes and cutely asks him to please fulfill her wish, but that's outright refused. Now completely stunned, she can only listen as Sora goes on a page-long extended rant about how selfish and unattractive he finds her. Well, with that off his chest, he feels much better, so Blank leaves the game. The onlooking sirens cheer for this conclusion, as her friends are left confused. Sora isn't sure what's going on either, Shiro had just told him to act like himself. Suddenly, the ice begins to crack as Queen Layla bursts forth, exclaiming it shouldn't be possible for someone to be that obnoxious. Next, she throws herself at Sora's feet, welcoming the arrival of her prince. The room is shocked into silence, followed by Shiro exclaiming they've won. Thinking back on the storybook, Steph recalls how the final man stabbed and killed the queen. This must have caused Layla, whom everyone worships, to be enthralled with the idea of a man who doesn't love her. 
Shiro states he should be nice and step on the queen, causing Layla to squirm asking for more. Plum can only sigh upon realizing this to be the epic conclusion to the Dampir's 800 year long struggle. A while later in Elkia, Steph thinks about how Blank acquired three races so quickly, and about how Amanity's race piece is the king of a chessboard. Sora and Shiro order Plum to quit hiding, as they wonder if Mr. Plum has come to reveal himself. It turns out Plum is actually the last Dampier male, which Shiro noticed just before the beach episode. Cringing to the fact he almost did that to a boy, Sora explains they uncovered the truth due to how Plum would always carefully redirect their questions instead of outright lying. Even so, Blank still played right into his hand, so they give him much deserved props and call it a draw. While laughing, our 2B Dampier King declares himself the true victor, because weak little Sora won everything Siren had, including the duty to let Dampier drink his blood. The fangs sink deep into Sora's neck, but for some reason they don't pierce the skin. It turns out shortly after winning, Sora gave Siren all their rights back, with the exception of some resources and ensuring they'll work together with Amanity. They once again praise Plum's strategy, and Shiro even states they want to find more allies like him. This Dampier pleads to at least drink their sweat again, and after a lot of bickering, they come to a trade. Plum will be allowed to partake, but in return he has to use the love spell on Sora. The spell is cast, Shiro activates it, but Sora doesn't feel any different than before. Our Dampier is confused for just a moment, but he then realizes what's going on. Sora prompts his little sister to explain, but she claims to have no idea what he's talking about. Quite a bit later, Sora asks about love once again, but Steph wants him to just give it a rest. Apparently, he has a daughter now, which definitely doesn't cause Steph to freak out. Our Flugo explains it's more of a clone of Queen Layla, as she probably snagged a few of Sora's hair, which she used to produce an offspring. Izuna announces said daughter is here, but wait, how does Siren get this far inland? Izuna states Plum arrived as well, followed by Sora screaming for Steph to find some water. Next, you see Feel and Kurami continuing their earlier conversation. It's explained that Sora never lies to himself, and earnestly believes he still has room to grow and improve. He does this because admitting he's reached humanity's limit would deem his precious little sister a non-human monster. The Shrine Maiden straight up admits that she would have sacrificed Eno, and he earnestly agrees rescuing him was an unnecessary risk. Miss Shrine Maiden then once again ponders if Sora and Shiro will actually turn her old dream into a reality. Just like Thibault, my newest patron, you too could get a shout out and early access to these videos.